when people want knowledge, it involves desire. It's never just an abstract, like, I want to know. It's always a relational thing. It's a relational thing. And like, I want it from other people. And even if I may not necessarily know what the content of like that wisdom or knowledge is, and wisdom, I'm not, I mean it in the sense of a relation thing, like it's something you're sharing or, or, or not sharing. It has to be given in terms that already I can sort of anticipate. Like I'll know it when it's here. And I, I think that that's, if there's any one thing these like Lacanian texts do in general, but I think that maybe Lacan will do for us as we, we go through some, our Lacanian period a little bit, like um, he, era, era <laughs> <laughs> is that he kind of makes you confront the way in which like meaning is never just a what, right? It's never just a simplistic given statement. What, what Lacan makes us think about is not just like, well, what does Lacan mean, <laughs> right? Or how do we understand these concepts and how can we then like rephrase them in the terms of like his own theory? He makes us think about the way in which meaning emerges as a process yeah. and as a relational encounter that is fraught with misinterpretation, with misrecognition, with anxiety, with desires to understand, the desire to be understood, the desire to have knowledge is a thing that you can use or, 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 or put to some purpose that has all its own psychic dividends. And I think on that level, what we're doing is the reason we're starting with the mirror stage, even though it's not necessarily central to Lacan's thought, is that like the uncanny does for Freud, it gives us a, a vivid scene, an evocative scene or an evocative concept or term, but also through reading the way in which Lacan articulates the concept, we come to appreciate how Lacan thinks and approaches other concepts more generally, precisely through things like insufficiency, paradox, the architectonics of his thought. He might be a thinker who, instead of having steampunk hydrodynamic buildups and releases, is a thinker who thinks in terms of, say, mirrorings or puzzles or short circuits. So the, the suggestion we're trying to make here is that if you get the sense of how Lacan, not just like what this concept is, but the way in which he stages the concept as a problem, you will then be able to use that orientation to get a sense of how Lacan thinks about other things entirely differently. And also you get to make sort of your own Lacan in terms of using that orientation for purposes that you might want to. We are having a conversation about this earlier. Well, we were talking about difficult texts yeah. um, and concepts and, you know, some of it was serious and some of it was <laughs> like yeah. a little bit like I was like, Patrick, you know, we're doing Lacan and people have all these sort of vexed relationships to it. And, you know, if Lacan thematizes anything, it's lack and desire. And there, so two things. One, I was like, let me just confess, I've never understood the idea of the Deleuzian body without organs. Like while we're just getting stuff out here, that has never made the slightest bit of sense to me. <laughs> and he was like, it's the muffin man. He's all muffin. <laughs> no <laughs> organs. <laughs> anyway, what I really wanted to bring in is an aphorism from Nietzsche, which long before Lacan was even a twinkle in his parents' eye, was out there in the world, which is this. The attraction of knowledge would be small if one did not have to overcome so much shame on the way. Um, and I think there's something, well, there's a lot there, obviously, and this is not a podcast about Nietzsche, and most of you would stop listening if I keep talking about this too long. So I'll simply say that even though shame is not a big Lacanian theme, I think it's one that we are working with here as we are trying to handle or manage the unpacking of this text, which although it is only five pages long, could be, I mean, we could do this for a year. We could do it for two years and we would not be in a state of, of perfect um, connaissance to use the French um, knowledge yeah. in the sense of recognition, where Patrick is saying, you know, in some ways the, the major Lacanian theme that we get from the mirror stage is, is méconnaissance, right? Misrecognition. But that there's something about, as we are trying to bring you along with us, we are trying to linger in that state, which is, not necessarily either, I mean, and connaissance is also it's like, like connaître is like to know someone, 
right? It's not about like knowledge, like savoir, abstract intellectual knowledge. I, I, I think we are really invested in not only showing you that to grapple with Lacan has to grapple with the unconscious, right? Or your own process of analysis, therapeutic or otherwise. Meaning making. Uh, yeah. Well, to be, you know, in this, this sort of ongoing process of opening out onto the unknown, it, it really allows you to understand what Freud is talking about when he's getting into the idea of interminability. This is a text that is inexhaustible and it's not only more fun, but it's also ultimately more useful to do the long, slow, circuitous, roundabout, seemingly tangential, definitely, definitely free associative route. And that's why we started out this episode being like, this is going to be one episode. And now I can tell you it's going to be three. Yeah. <laughs> then we were like, it's going to be two. It's going to be three. A major Lacanian theme is lack, misrecognition, lack. These are all things that are about the absence of fullness or the absence yeah. of wholeness. But there's a flip side of that, which is the plenitude of interpretation. Yeah. The first thing just to, to re- I want to say is that Do you know the Muffin Man? The question of like meaning is, and and it's inexhaustibility, I think really is worth sitting with just for one second. Like think about the last time you had a fight with a partner, right? Well, this is an overdetermined example. Well, that's exactly, it's an example of overdetermination, right? Because like two or three sentences between you and someone who, yeah, like your lover, right? You can not only result in a situation where someone has stormed out of the house potentially never to come back, but you can reference an entire relationship, a year's worth of previous conversations, conversations that didn't happen, betrayals, characterizations, et cetera. Like it's infinitely deep in some way. Um, and, you know, arguably what happens in psychotherapy is even more so, right? Like these, this is this Freudian idea that we continually betray ourselves, right? So I think yeah. part of what we're trying to do here is, is to do justice to the way in which meaning making is intersubjective and very much uh, something that reflects a, something about, you know, if we'll speak abstractly, like, but like about the human, right? Like, I, I think one way where we could read even what we're going to do in the mirror stage is like this, Lacan is saying, like the human, you know, it, per Aristotle, like the human is like the reasoning animal, right? The rational animal. animal. Yeah, you know, that's what we do. We, we think. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Lacan, it's like, well, we're identifying animals. Or yeah. We're desiring animals, right? And sure, that's a thing you could say to summarize this text, but it wouldn't capture everything in the text. And it also wouldn't make sense unless you've been through the text, as I'll, I'll suggest. And this is the second half of what you were saying that I think is very helpful. About shame. About shame, but also about like the anxiety of wanting to arrive at a determined meaning that you can, that will be like, okay, this is where we were going all along. And so so you already can see the outline of the thing on the horizon and thus you're always moving towards it. Right. Which when you think about it is a type of a relationship where like, here's the goal, here's this thing I see in the distance. I yearn for it. I want to arrive at it and it will satisfy me when I get there. And I think that dynamic of attraction of a journey that's predetermined of a fate that's predestined and which could be captured in these little phrases like look there's misrecognition at the heart of identification right or we are not self-identical all these little statements again that could be described as what this essay means that the full stakes of that that yearning and the ways in which we might be able to not necessarily do it or think more critically about it or live in a way that's less painful in relation to it is something you can only fully appreciate once you've gone through the process of the text itself, right? The destination changes as you get there. And what we're preoccupied with here is, and I think what makes psychoanalysis so interesting, is less like here are a set of concepts, but rather it's how the concepts work together or how different concepts can work together as part of a way of thinking, right? It's not just a set of meanings. It's a way of interpreting meaning and making meaning and seeing meaningfulness in things. So it's a process and an orientation more than it is just a structure, a vocabulary. A destination. listening to 
to Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin. I'm Patrick Blanchfield. I'm Dan Yowell. And today we are heading into part two of our multi-part episode on Lacan's Mirror Stage. And for those of you who are reading along with us in the Bruce Fink translation of Écrit, we are on page 76, a full page and a third I'm into so proud of us. where we started last time. And with your permission, friends, I would like to read a paragraph. Let's do it. Let me just set the stage. Where we left off, the baby was jubilant, right? Mm -hmm. Um, in front of the mirror, confronting its own image. And aha. we left off being, oh yeah, aha, the aha experience. Everything seemed great. It's all going to be a little bit downhill from there. Uh -huh. um, so now we're going to get, <laughs> stop that. <laughs> uh, now we're going to get into what is meant here by identification, which is going to be more complicated than this the recognition of the self in the mirror right that 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 initial aha moment we're gonna uh, decompose that um in a sense okay so now i'm quoting lacan it suffices to understand the mirror stage in this context as an identification in the full sense analysis gives to the term namely the transformation that takes place in the subject when he assumes an image, an image that is seemingly predestined to have an effect at this phase, as witnessed by the use in analytic theory of antiquity's term imago. Um, and before we dive into that, I'm also just going to remind people that we are thinking about this baby uh, around six to 18 months. So as, as you visualize, we are, we are fully in the realm of, of, of imagination, the image, the imaginary, the specular, blah, 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 blah. You get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, so have your, have your imaginary baby in your imaginary mirror um, at imaginary hand. Patrick, what's going on here with identification? And perhaps we'll also want to get to this term, the imago after that. Let's just like lean for one second on the word identification, right? As a noun, identification, what can it mean? To see myself in something else. What's well, a closing the gap? I, I mean, it's, it's to, to predicate something of an I, I guess. So like I write myself into a scene or like I. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking like almost grammatically, like I am tired. <laughs> you know, yes. I, okay. I am special. I am a girl, like literally like to predicate, like there's, there is some sort of thing that is an I that's, that's what I would think of and there. And there's some sort of, um, no, there's a copula. There's a copula. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That's the word I'm looking for. The yeah. copula is the, the, the am. And so I'm, so to identify with, with a thing, um, and maybe this is like philosopher brain going on is like to, to predicate something of the I, um, that, that melds it with me. I take it, I take it on. But again, so closing, closing of a gap by way of that copula. I realize that like, that's not what Lacan means because this is all like pre, the babies, babies don't talk. Right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm adult. Abby is reaching for this language right. that is not there. And, and that's, right. I think partly where, where you're going in some way that identification right. here involves the image and it also doesn't have that self that i already there to to predicate Th that is where i am going and that is the lacan just doesn't just stage the problem of how do we know what the baby first that experience of identification is nor still is it just underscoring how it's difficult for us to talk about that infantile, i.e. an experience for a non-speaking child yeah. experience as adults without using adults concepts. He's also using the example in this mythic way of the child taking on its first identification to do work at exploding, criticizing, or otherwise making us think differently about the stakes of our adult notions of identification in general. Mm -hmm. So identification, whether we look at it philosophically as, say, a, a statement of equivalence. Right, right. 
or as the um, selection of certain attributes that produce um, a, a relationship of equivalence between entities. Or we could look at it as the act of identifying. Identification as a noun in that sense is just simply that action. Mm -hmm. So it could be both a given quantity or a given, it could be a relationship or a act of relating. It also is like very literally identification is the thing that you like carry in your wallet and that you have to produce in order to drive or like when a cop asks you for it, yep, yep. right? So identification in all these different senses is somehow implicated here, but that identification is structured as, it, it is troped as an assumption. Right. It's, I, I think of it as like the putting on a mantle in some, in some sort of way. When you assume the robes of office, yeah. Right, exactly. But I mean, the thing, and we're going to get to this in the very next paragraph, because there's some, there's some already like necessarily misleading language here. Yeah. Um, when Lacan says like the subject assumes an image, is like there is no subject yet, right? We are talking about the very process of subject formation. So in, in, in some ways, and, and again, we're going to get to this in the next graph, there's something kind of wonky or misplaced about the very language of there being a subject already there to assume an image. So it's more like get rid of that language of subject, get rid of that language of I and actually just imagine the thing in the mirror and, and some sort of nascent sense of self, which is only coming into being through the sight. And he calls that an assumption, right? It's, right. it's both a, a premise mm -hmm. for the creation of this little infantile person and like the template for all our adult talking about identification that sort of captures its insufficiencies or captures its stakes. So it's both a premise for something, the creation of a person, but also it sort of preemptively misses something as well, mm -hmm. right? It, it writes the self into the mirror. It's the baby sort of feeling or finding itself jubilantly, but that's what creates the self. And we can only see this retrospectively. The other term that I think is, is very germane here is the weaning he puts on this, this Latin word imago. Oh, good. I was just right? going to ask you to, yeah. if you wanted to, to flesh that out a little bit. The imago, right? The idea of like a, it, it has a sense of image in the Latin, but also it's related to the word for copy, or for like, what we might even say is like a simulacrum or a reproduction mm -hmm. of a thing. It's the image of a thing. It also has, and this is a, a meaning that I, I only learned recently from a student, in fact, is that it has a sense in biology and specifically entomology uh, in which the imago is the form of an insect when it reaches its final maturity, hmm. i.e. such that like, if you were to like look up a, a butterfly, you would get an image not of the little grub or the cocoon or the caterpillar or the cocoon. You would get the fully hatched butterfly. They call it that sometimes, at least in, in like older writing, that like the butterfly you see pinned, that's the imago. This is, it's, it's, so it's both a destiny. It's the destiny that you move for. It's the predestined final form of your development. It's the telos and also... There's this language of fixing, of capture, of like pinning down, of correction. Is that also where this word predestination comes in? Yep. This is why he calls it like a template for all subsequent identifications. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea here is that the child seeing itself in the mirror, which makes the child, which is like the initial scene of the child identifying itself as a child, basically, or, or creating itself as a site of identification that it can then attribute things, that it can then see equivalence or similarity, all those things we just Where talked it about. Can, that it can predicate things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It involves a kind of like orientation, not just towards like an ideal form or to like some sort of process of orientation towards the future. It also involves a kind of bootstrapping in the present. Can we read the next yeah. paragraph? And I think that's going to kind of get us there too. Um, because we, we, we're getting to, you know, in, in some ways is like the change in this nascent subject with the realization of some sort of externalization uh, that doesn't map on to the felt self. Okay, so I'm picking up right after I left off with the paragraph that, in, that involves Patrick's favorite adjective, I can tell from from listening to him talk about this jubilant. Okay, uh, I'm now quoting Lacan again. The jubilant assumption 
of his specular image by the kind of being still trapped in his motor impotence and nursling dependence. The little man is at the infan stage. Thus seems to me to manifest in an exemplary situation the symbolic matrix in which the I is precipitated in a primordial form prior to being objectified in the dialectic of identification with the other and before language restores to it in the universal its function as subject, close quote. Um, I want to flag here that, you know, we've been talking about like the nascent I or subject but before baby sees baby in a mirror, baby, I'm, I'm getting rid of the eye language. I was going with baby. <laughs> baby feels like a mess in this top baby, like can't stand up by itself, constantly flooded by sensation, perception, not able to navigate the world insufficient motor, sk- I mean, not, insu- I, I'm, I'm not like shaming, I'm not like baby shaming for, for, I'm just saying like at this stage, like a baby doesn't have all of the motor skills um, that an adult does. So motor impotence, right. Can't get around the way that, that it wants to, you know, in the way that as an adult, many people can aim themselves at, you know, at a certain point and then walk there can't actually hold itself up, you know, can hold its head up at this point. But the point is, this is not a creature that could survive on its own, right? It doesn't have control of its limbs. It doesn't have an idea of what it is. Yeah, I mean, we're getting, we're, that's what we're working through. But what I'm trying to give you is a sense of like, this is not a fawn or a foal or something that like a few hours after birth can like get around. Yeah. This this creature can't do anything for itself and so it feels like an incoherent mess. All right. So that is primary before. So that's that's baby. Okay. Baby's baby is an incoherent mess and then baby sees baby in the mirror. We also I think don't want to hang it, hang this too much on a specifically biological notion of development insofar right. as that the second half of that graph you just read, right, where, where, where Lacan is like, there are later identifications. There are identifications with, say, I am the child of this person who is nursing me, or I am a two-year-old now, or I'm a big boy, or I'm, I'm a, a proud kid. American, right? Mm-hmm. Like all these different <laughs> ways in which you proud get... Proud American I, baby. Yeah, all these different <laughs> ways in which I, I'm, I'm the president again. Uh, <laughs> all these ways in which, like, again, these other operations of identification. Yeah which can be as sophisticated also as like, I don't know, 16 year old me being like, Oh no, 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 no officer. I'm actually going to take out the fake idea I got at the little bodega. Right. Like all these different ways in which to understand like identity is both a thing that you get pulled into. I interpolated. And yes, this is where Althusser gets that concept. We'll talk about that later. Uh, But also ways of like producing your own identification or being like, you know, I'm a Samantha or I'm really sad right now. All these different things. Like a Samantha from sex in the city. That's exactly what I was going for. (laughs) I didn't um, see that coming. All the subsequent operations of identification, right, are prefigured or everything you need to know about the fundamental dynamics of those later identifications is implicated in this founding act of identification in which a helpless child who has neither control over its own body nor the capacity to use language to describe what it's experiencing arrives at a fictive or we could call fictional or imaginary, but in any event, temporary in space at time and mediated through a mirror sense of holism. In other words, the grounds of the self of that I, which is implicated in all those other later identifications, departs from the initial shaky sort of foundation of our constitution of self is mediated. Mm -hmm. To put it very succinctly, Lacan seems to be suggesting that prior to any other identifications or like the basic structure of all these later, more sophisticated identifications lies the haunting image of... The finding of the self outside the self. Yes, and of the baby, a desperate baby who, you know, is incapable of caring for itself, but somehow seems driven in the way that that foal is driven to run, to identify, to laugh, to play. Like, we're identifying animals to 
to look in the mirror and say, ah, it me, and take pleasure in that rather than, you know, concentrate on learning how to run. Right. And again, this is prior to language. Um, and I, I, I want to, to just stress this phrase from the passage I already read, um, that this is, Lacan says, this is how the I is precipitated in a primordial form. All right. This is, this is a, a sort of primal scene of the sort of like incipient self. Pri- again, I'm quoting, prior to being objectified in the dialectic of identification with the other, right? So even before the self is constituted in and through the other, there is this self that is coming into being, but it is coming into being in the gap between the messiness of the feeling body and this thing in the mirror that seems a whole lot less messy, that seems like one thing. It's fixed, right? The mirror fixes you to the extent to which it gives you an image of yourself in your best, in your idealized form, right? Think here about, I don't know, again, I know we're going very linearly through these concepts in a very basic way, but if you're already starting to think about like Instagram selfies or like the best self you construct for others, you're on the right track, right? The idea here is that the original moment in which the baby is like constituted as like a demi subject. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. Is its moment of self identification is actually a misidentification or an identification of itself as something that is actually outside the self, that is actually just a reflection of a self, or to put it again, this is why this is so hard to summarize without sounding like paradoxical Kant, the thing that you think is actually you is just a reflection of you frozen in time that catches your attention and that you take pleasure in, and that becomes the desired template for all subsequent identifications, or at least the basic format of identification. Before other beings, other actual beings come into the mix in terms of the constitution of, of how one understands oneself. And to, to reprise what Lacan said just several paragraphs above, right? This dual sense, one, that the thing that I am is actually a artifice of a assertion of selfhood through mediation and alienation. Artifice or artifact? Both. I mean, I mean yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but but like, yeah, the mirror. It, like, this isn't the child. Like, it's a it's a mirror that somebody put there in a wall, right? Like, it's worth even spelling out the degrees of alienation, right? Not only is the child an inchoate shitting mess, right, in a trot de bay being held up because otherwise it would face plant, right? The thing that's in the mirror is a two dimensional flipped <laughs> on that axis artifact of technology and light being like reflecting back in to the eyes of the child, right? There's a whole different series in which that child is not, the thing in the mirror is literally not the child, but perceiving the thing in the mirror makes the child capable of, in this account, subsequently articulating or participating in more complicated operations of identification down the line. And disidentification. Exactly. And the stakes of this are, as in that paragraph earlier, at once libidinal and a libidinal dynamism, right? This is a dynamic. I want to be this thing. Every time I read this, I have this like mental, I don't know if this is helpful at all, but I have this mental image of like a laptop desktop background and the baby has been going through life gathering files, like video files, audio files, all this stuff. And it's just, have you ever seen like a really messy desktop background, like icons everywhere? You can't find anything. He's trying to clean mine up. Yeah. And then the baby looks into the mirror and all of a sudden it creates a folder called me and it can start sorting through all yeah. those things. And then the things that it chooses to drop into that me folder have repercussions. Uh, but either way, like all of a sudden now we have this one thing that kicks off organization and we can start mapping all this stuff. And uh, like the desktop starts getting cleaner and more yeah. parsable yeah. over yeah. time. Yes. Beautiful. It's a gestalt. Yeah. 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 yeah.
promise we're not reading this in the entirety of this essay out loud, but this page, we are going paragraph by paragraph. And then at some point we're going to start skipping when Lacan starts talking about like locusts and pigeons and gonads and stuff like that. But for now, important to walk through. I'm picking up right where I left off. This form would moreover have to be called the ideal eye if we wanted to translate it into a familiar register in the sense that it will also be the rootstock of secondary identifications, this latter term subsuming the libidinal normalization functions. But the important point is that this form situates the agency known as the ego prior to its social determination in a fictional direction that will forever remain irreducible for any single individual or rather, that will only asymptotically approach the subject's becoming, no matter how successful the dialectical syntheses by which he must resolve, as I, his discordance with his own reality. One just sort of technical note um, that is that does appear in the footnotes is that um, Freud does say ideal I, this is a term that Freud uses like fairly liberally. Um, I, I think of it as being like a early Freud before we get like thoroughly into the idea of the superego. But Lacan pretty much uses it here and then drops it. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to to note that. A gloss to helpfully sort of situate what's at stake in that, right, is, is that this idea of the ideal eye, again, I don't want us to go down the technical rabbit hole of Freud's theory of narcissism. But one thing that Although we'll do an episode on it uh, at yeah, some point. Takes it's several, a great essay. Yeah, cats and babies. Cats and babies and yeah. women. Women, cats, and babies, and their indifference <laughs> to adult men. Um, hey, can you blame them? <laughs> what is at stake here in talking about ideal eyes or social determinations, etc.? Let's just succinctly say that we that a recurring question in any theory of development is how does the child come to understand who itself as someone either worthy of love or that has a, uh, that is just, is deserving of its own efforts of self-preservation, uh-huh. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, just the most inchoate impulse, like how does the eye, how does the baby know that it is a thing that needs to avoid pain, right? But also later, well, how does self-esteem come from? No, I think you're, I mean, I, I'm following you, but I think you're maybe conflating two things, like, like one as how do you underst- how do you feel, not even understand, how do you feel like you are a thing? Because in order to move around in the world as like a toddler yes. and beyond, there has to be some, some sense of self, even if you want to think of it as fundamentally fictive, yes. right? That sense of wholeness. But in order to navigate the world, you need that. Yeah. Um, and that is the, the foundation of, you know, stability, fictive or no, on which you can then build right. what you're talking about in terms of like deservingness. Yeah. So technically, so technically what we're talking about here is like this idea, like how do you, how does the, what's the initial investment of the infant person in their own like self-preservation or their own awareness of themselves as like a physical quantity is something that Freud was trying to talk about in terms of like primary narcissism. Yeah. Right. But there are also these questions of like, how does the child come to develop a more sophisticated narrative sense of self based upon the feedback from others? Right. When the mom picks up the child and is like, I'm so proud. I love you so much. Well, I'm so proud of you. You just did this. Right. Or mm-hmm. dad's like, you're, you're my, f- I, I love you so much, son, when you're great at baseball. Right. Like, in, in other words, the way you start picking up internalized images of who you should be that you want to be. Right. Right. Again, uh, that gap between the feeling self and the specular image. Yes. Th- that, so, so these are these later, more sophisticated things of who I should be and who I must be and who I actually am, et cetera. Underwriting all of these, though, and kind of undoing them or pointing to an anxiety that goes under all of them is this initial encounter, mm-hmm. which is actually a non-encounter. This original act of identification which is both an act of identification and an arrival at an identification, but what he describes as an asymptotic relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this is like a, this is a term from math, right? If you, if you think about um, like a curve that is approaching um, a line, but never arrives at it. Um, and it's always getting closer and closer and closer, but there will never be an actual collision 
so it, it, in a fu- when a function, and here we are back to the title, behaves asymptotically, the variable or the quantity, whatever it is that we're looking at, is always getting closer to a point, but never actually is at the point. Right. 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 And, and it never will. Right. It's predestined. It's oriented towards not this thing. Not when you're thing, born, not when you die. But it can't ever get there. Right. And I think that like, let's, let's uh, get out of like theory world for, for a minute and and into the uncanniness to go back to what you're saying. And maybe we'll learn some things about ourselves and also about like gender and relation to mirrors in this conversation. But like, there's an uncanniness every time you look in the mirror because you don't ever see in a very basic way, the mirror stage is dramatizing the irreducible difference between a first person and a third person Mm. perspective. Okay. Like, so you are moving around in the world and you're seeing things, um, you're smelling things, your taste, whatever, you know, all of these, all five senses, Mm -hmm. right. All of them, Um, all of them, all five of them. Yeah. 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 Um, but you are never seeing yourself, um, as Patrick always likes to say, glossing Lacan, like you can't see the back of your own head, but also you can't see the front of your own head. Right. And so the thing that other people see when they see you is the thing that you, by definition, cannot see until you look into a mirror, which probably most of us do at some point in the morning as we gather the messy jangle of apprehensions and perceptions um, and feelings of tiredness and feelings of excitement and feelings of despair and whatever, and look and you know, try to put on some eyeliner and figure out how that thing that's looking at you is somehow the same thing, even as it's not the same thing as that surface to which you are, um, you know, applying, I don't know, styling cream. We all have curly hair, so I'm looking at us being like, (laughs) as we're all applying hair products or as we're, you know, and as you're going about your day, right? In, in the grind of, of late capitalism, right? You don't get necessarily to sit and, and think every morning as you look in the mirror. Um, gosh, there's like a fundamental gap between my feeling self and, and the thing that I see that I am now presenting and that I'm going to move through um, and show everybody, right? You don't necessarily have that time to reflect on that. But I think for many people, to look into the mirror or to look at a selfie, to, you know, hold up your phone um, with the the camera facing you is jarring. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that I think is like a little bit clearer in some ways. Just like get a sense that jarringness, the what everyone else sees of me isn't how I feel. That's a gap. That is at the very foundation of the creation of selfhood before language for Lacan. How does that connect to shame? That's a great, great question. question. I think, you know, one of the words that, that Lacan uses is the gestalt. It's that you, you, um, you see, and, and again, shame is not a big Lacanian theme, but I do think we're, we're talking about it here. And it's, it's the right word here is more something like lack or gap. Um, there seems to be, whether it's baby in the mirror or it's, you know, 40 something me in the mirror looking tired and being like, how am I going to get, how am I going to get through today? Um, there seems to be something like that person, even if her hair is really messy or whatever, seems to have her shit together. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like in that, like there's one entity that's there and we don't always feel like one entity. In fact, we feel like there is this sense of like, you can't live up to that self because that self seems to have a wholeness, the specular, the image that, that your felt experience of embodiment and movement um, and just like the ways in which you feel different in the morning than you do in the evening. You can't live up to that image of yourself mm. and you could trope that as shame. I think for Lacan, it's more accurate to think about it as as lack or misrecognition. But there is this thing is like, the, okay, when I look in the mirror, I recognize myself. But I don't know about you. Every day when I look in the mirror, I'm surprised. 
maybe this is just because I didn't have glasses and I don't really know what I look like. Um, but there's something that's a little jarring every single day. And this is, this is relevant too, because, you know, as an adult, you are not just mirrored by the mirror. You're mirrored by every person that you come into contact with. And so, you know, if I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I I don't feel a whole lot like a, an accomplished self with like professional achievements and, you know, all of these things, like I'm going to see Patrick and he's going to mirror back to me something that, you know, might help me move on with my day. You know, maybe he gives me a little mm. pep talk or, or, or something like that. But the way that I see him look at me shores up the sense of the self that is coherent. But there's still always that sense of the gap. Another way of thinking about this, and I, I think that, that might be help a way for us to situate the idea of shame or like anxiety about yourself Anxiety is a good word. Yeah, here, I it's, think. it's yeah. a constant thinker of anxiety. Like that thing that was elegantly smuggled in in the Cartesian cogito. I think, therefore, I am, and that I is me and my existence, both my thinking and my existence are self present to me yeah. in this stable mm-hmm. way. And, you know, I'm a brain in the vat that does not exist in time, is undone by it's the, the image dream of, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> who doesn't dream? It is undone by the image of this baby in a in what you could almost call like a tragic drama, right? The baby, it's a, it's tragic because it, 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 it's damned to this in some ways, or it seems to be predestined as, as an act of necessity, right? The, and, and to be clear again, no, no, this is a parable. Clearly there have been tons of children brought up in societies where they have no access to mirrors, mm-hmm. right? Mutatis mutandis, we could use the mirror as a metaphor for many other things, right? Uh, whether it be social recognition or hell, FaceTime or any other contingency, but the the fundamental core of this idea that's captured in this image is of a child making sense of its experience, or rather the field of strange sensations and chaos that is the embodiment of the child gets some degree of coherence in a way that's reassuring and pleasurable, but that is also an alienation at the heart of supposedly finding yourself or seeing yourself, and that puts you in a relation, and this is where Lacan is very different from Freud. This is about gaps and literal equations, even differential equations, of you're trying to arrive at an identity that you are never quite going to be at. And that kind of existential, so to speak, plight, or that like reality, right? You have to identify, but you're never just the identification. Mm -hmm. Implicates every subsequent identification that you do and suggests how there's a kind of insufficiency, both an overreach and an inadequacy to those other operations of identification that we do every day or that we're forced to do every day. Yeah. And we could think of other examples that might be helpful here, whether they be as granular and specific as, you know, some of the research done on, on asking people who have certain eating disorders, right. Or certain types of dysmorphia, like what, what do you see yourself as when you look in the mirror and the images that they will, that they're haunted by of themselves bear no rapport with their increasingly, you know, skeletal and vulnerable forms, right. They're literally always trying to be something in the mirror that isn't even what is in the mirror. Right. Or it could be as well in language, in the symbolic, so to speak, as are self-credentializing as, well, as a, I don't know, as the father of a daughter, I believe I've come to understand this, right? Or as a, as a responsible gun owner, right? As an, speaking as an American or Mm -hmm. or like, I'm not a lawyer, but like what I think Lacan allows us to suggest is how underwriting all those articulations of identification, which are also, you know, could be of political solidarity or of your preferences in the world or of your, your identifications or disidentifications with others and which are ongoing and dynamic. Think about hell, like why do people hang their degrees in rooms and places where they work? If not as a type of identification, yep, right? Yep. Uh, that underwriting all of those is the poss- the desire to be the thing or the desire to have arrived at the thing or yeah. to have the thing when in fact you're always in this position of trying to get to the thing or being potentially anxious about not being there, ashamed with the, like imposter syndrome that you're not there or kind of like malignantly insisting that yes, you are. Much as it's very difficult to talk about the baby's experience as an adult, I find it very difficult to talk about Freud without like have, using Lacanian language too, right? But mm-hmm. like, 
identification or identity in the fullest senses of the term that we hear it in the 21st century, from identity politics to all the different sort of like mathematical things to even like the idea of having like showing ID as a Mm. way to extricate yourself or get into potentially life-threatening circumstances. That's not quite the way in which Freud thinks about identification. He'll talk about identifications. He'll talk about logics of identification and projection, et cetera. But the fullness of the way in which identification is like a, a, an ingredient into systems of what you could call power and knowledge and desire, that's a very Lacanian way of thinking about it. And this way in which the baby's primordial identification has these aspects of both pleasure but also of a kind of tragedy yeah, of Mm. self-presence, but also being haunted by a kind of absence Mm -hmm. of like yearning to arrive. It's also taken as, oh, I'm here. I'm finally here, but wait, I'm never going to really be here. It it makes me think of a, of a mental image, which is a, 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 comes from an experience that I've had and that maybe many other Americans or at least some other Americans have had. If you drive for a commute, And you pass billboards for housing developments that are going up. And they say, if you lived here, you'd be home by now. Yeah. I feel like, which is, you know, paradoxical and infuriating, particularly if you're in gridlock, right? But I feel like every one of these identifying gestures, which we both are compelled to make, but which are compelled upon us and which we desire to have arrived, but also they kind of lock you into a trajectory of never arriving at the thing. They feel like so many appeals that are underwritten with the tonalities of if you just were this thing you'd be home by now um that gives me a very lovely segue into the next two passages that i want to read and i want to read them and this is this is the end of this this section but it's really about this idea of the gestalt okay so i'm quoting Again, I'm picking up right where I left off. This is the final part of the section that we want to read from from this portion of the essay. For the total form of his body, by which the subject anticipates the maturation of his power in a mirage, is given to him only as a gestalt, that is, in an exteriority in which, to be sure, this form is more constitutive than constituted, but in which, above all, it appears to him is the contour of his stature that freezes it and in a symmetry that reverses it in opposition to the turbulent movements with which the subject feels he animates it. Through these two aspects of its appearance, this gestalt, whose power should be considered linked to the species, though its motor style is as yet unrecognizable, symbolizes the eye's mental permanence at the same time as it prefigures its alienating destination. This gestalt is also replete with the correspondences that unite the eye with the statue onto which man projects himself, the phantoms that dominate him, and the automaton with which the world of his own making tends to achieve fruition in an ambiguous relation. Indeed, for Imagos, whose veiled faces we analysts see emerge in our daily experience and in the penumbra of symbolic effectiveness, the specular image seems to be the threshold of the visible world. If we take into account the mirrored disposition of the imago of one's own body in hallucinations and dreams, whether it involves one's individual features or even one's infirmities or object projections, or if we take note of the mirror apparatus in the appearance of doubles, in which cyclical realities manifest themselves that are, moreover, heterogeneous. This is a lovely sequence that also gets us about as close as this essay is going to get to clinical material. Yes, yes, for um, sure. Good point. Uh, in so, and also goes... Which is really yeah. glancing. Yeah, and also goes... We see this yeah. in, the, in the clinical setting, yeah. And also goes into that stuff that... Uh, like that basket of like both applied psychoanalysis and also a little bit of metapsychology and, and case history stuff. Plus, and this is a bonus for you, it has that hint of the uncanny with the double. Yeah, exactly. So at this point, I think we could read like the, we could kind of 
do a Lacanian reading of, of the double here and be like, well, what is the double for Lacan? Like the double, you know, much as it appears in fantasy is psychotic delusions, dreams, literature for Freud is, you know, is a sign of um, the strangeness and the, the kind of torrid overdetermination of our relations in the family and of what we call home. Mm-hmm. For Lacan, the double here is about the anxieties of the assertion of identity and of a stability of self over and against the ways in which our bodies, you know, uh, or our senses of ourselves are not captured by that or come up against it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whether it be, you know, the, you wake up in the morning and then suddenly I don't think about the first day I ever saw facial hair on myself and like how alienating mm-hmm. that was. Right. But also other types of alienation that I think are worth considering here. And this is the clinical stuff when he's talking about like, Images of the imago of one's body coming apart. He uses some phrases like pièce morcelle, like cut up little bits. This That's is his, a little later. Yeah, this is his clinical work with um, people who are having psychotic experiences or who are hallucinating under duress or are just dreaming. You do sometimes have this image or the the scene where like bodies fall apart or bodies are laying in places, and uh, you know they get cut cut up in little bits. And Lacan, in his work on psychosis, finds this to be a recurrent feature of, of, of psychotic hallucinations, mm-hmm. of even everyday dreaming, too. And in that way, he traces that back to this originary problem and anxiety of identification, right? It's haunted by that. So you're, you're literally, your body is, identification kind of haunts your body with the fear of your body coming apart. Right. That's that. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's the, like, that's the sort of, like, the promise and the fear of the gestalt, right? Of the, the, the sight of the self is whole over and against the felt knowledge of the lack of wholeness. I want to read, before we go today, I want to return to, so we are, we are skipping, we are, we are halfway through this essay, folks, maybe even more than halfway through this essay. We're going to return, um, because we've kind of marked this up basically in terms of parts that we absolutely have to talk about and things that we can can gloss. Lacan now moves to to this whole uh, excursus on the idea of the gestalt. He gets into like, I'm not going to say like animal husbandry, but like (laughs) definitely into like a whole realm um, (laughs) that is not as salient for us trying to read this as some sort of like primal scene of subject formation. And so we want to pick up um, for those of you who are reading along, it's on the bottom of page 77. We're returning to the theme that has persisted here of both knowledge and the paranoiac relation to knowledge. Okay. So last long paragraph for the day. As I myself have shown, human knowledge is more independent than animal knowledge from the force field of desire because of the social dialectic that structures human knowledge as paranoiac. But what limits it is the scant reality, surrealistic unsatisfaction denounces therein. These reflections lead me to recognize in the spatial capture manifested by the mirror stage, the effect in man, even prior to this social dialectic, of an organic inadequacy of his natural reality, assuming we can give some meaning to the word nature. The function of the mirror stage thus turns out, in my view, to be a particular case of the function of imagos, which is to establish a relationship between an organism and its reality, or as they say, between the Innenwelt and the Umwelt. In man, however, This relationship to nature is altered by a certain dehiscence at the very heart of the organism, a primordial discord betrayed by the signs of malaise and motor uncoordination of the neonatal months. The objective notions of the anatomical incompleteness of the pyramidal tracts and of certain humoral residues of the maternal organism in the newborn confirm my view that we find in man a veritable specific prematurity of birth. You want to talk? Okay, close quote. You want to talk about this idea of dehiscence? Yeah. So so here again, we have a layering on of further metaphors from dehiscence, which 
can mean in biology a very specific plant biology. Yeah, it's so a plant biology. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of like animal ethology, plant biology. You, you got to admire the commitment to it's really just taking metaphors from everywhere. Yeah. And, and the through line in these metaphors, whether it be the imago or the plant, right, is, the, is this idea of there's like a form or a model, not just in these disciplines, but in the things themselves. A, a form or a model of what the organism is going to become or should become or must become or can't but be impelled to become. Note, there's a kind of slippage here. It's not just descriptive. It's also kind of cryptonormative. All these invocations of whether they be plants or animals and their developmental schemes, well, they have a kind of rigidity to them, at least from Lacan's perspective. Yeah. A kind of quote unquote natural logic to them, which the human in this paradoxical way that's born like too early or like is too, the world is too much with it, you might say. <laughs> it's too dependent on others. Its experiences and capacity for stimulus is too overwhelming. It has this response, which is both adaptive, but maladaptive. We'll talk about adaptation in this essay next week, but like which is that instead of being able to run, you identify. Instead of being able to like go into a cocoon, you have this act of identification that's necessary and important. But Lacan seems to be saying that on the one hand, as a model of getting locked in to a developmental trajectory or into a relationship to who you should be or should become, we can talk about human beings in those terms. But we can also whether theoretically or personally or clinically, have naive, seemingly natural, which is why he puts that word nature in quotes, models that we expect of the subject or that we expect of ourselves to necessarily arrive at or to correspond to. And Lacan seems to suggest <laughs> that those outcomes are not given. Yeah, absolutely. Or that we also might be losing something in the drama of the human and its anxieties and the way in which knowledge has is the saturated both self-knowledge, but knowledge of others and the way in which knowledge of ourself is mediated through others, all the different fault lines of anxiety and desire and yearning and insufficiency and all the movements and human dimensions of that, those reduplicate and proliferate through other types of identifications. And they're not as deterministic or as linear as these other supposedly animal models. And that this is, lies at the core of how we conceive of ourselves as subjects that are separated from the world, how we organize our own internal experience, but also how we live out the narratives of identification or the own sort of quote unquote destinies that we take ourselves to be naturally given, but which we have in fact assumed. So, so we're going to leave off here in, in this, this space of where, where the subject, this incipient subject is, is, uh, you know, torn between the, the, the Innenwelt, the, the, the inner world and the, the Umwelt, the, um, the world that the external world that it's experiencing and moving through, um, we're going to sort of linger in what is, you know, the, the sort of the truth of the subject, um, of, of that distinction for Lacan and when we pick up with our third and dare I say it final episode on, it. that jinx <laughs> on the mirror stage we're going to talk more in concrete terms about what this looks like but also about what it means for the relation of the self to others um, which which we may frame in terms of the mother certainly but also in terms of the constitution of subjectivity once that self becomes a little more like chitinous, yes. a little bit more rigid, a little bit more armored, um, even though there's a real fragility to that. Um, so what that looks like. Now, all this may seem rather abstract still, even as I think we've gotten a little bit closer to sensing how actually this sort of parable about the baby might have relevances to how we position ourselves in social context. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Or how we're haunted by 
coulda, woulda, shouldas, or imposter syndrome versions of who we must be or should be or would rather be, or how we suddenly feel that we may be known better by others and are scared by it or any of these other things. I think that if we really run with this as, and we trace the implications and uses of this essay by others, as we will in the next session, Mm -hmm. we will in a way that is not just warranted, I think by the cycle or the reading of Lacan or even by a broadly psychoanalytic orientation, but that may also be useful for people who want to think about things in terms of say issues of like, say political solidarity or the identification Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. constituencies or this thing that is, or the many things that are oftentimes both done violence to and brought together as like the phrase identity politics, right? I think we can, we'll have a much more capacious and suggestive understanding of the role of appeals to identity, the shortcomings of appeals to identity and, and the sort of the double bind, this, this paradoxical necessity where both you have to identify, we must identify, identifications are necessary, but also identifications are fragile and identifications don't capture the whole of what's at stake in any given person, group, or moment. And that sort of difficult relation to, to, to both allow for recognition, but to understand how misrecognition is also inescapable is I think a properly political task. And as we'll see, Lacan is going to suggest arriving at that capacity to, to disambiguate, to think in those terms simultaneously is for him the promise of psychoanalysis. So stick around for the next installment of the mirror stage. We'll be back next week with a wild analysis episode. If you cannot get enough ordinary unhappiness we do put out two patreon episodes per month and you can join us and support us and help us stay afloat at patreon.com slash ordinary unhappiness we are a podcast that is deliberately ad free because we do not want to shill for things that we do not believe in um, like AI mental health uh, (laughs) for instance and uh, your support helps us keep going if we can also ask you to rate and review on your preferred podcast platform we would be so grateful thank you so much folks we'll be back next week bye until soon love you This has been an episode of Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin, and today I was joined by Patrick Blanchfield and Dan Yowell. This podcast is produced by Dan Yowell. Theme music by Formal Chicken. <laughs>